Okay, I think we're good. I think we're on the air. Okay, I think so, we're live. Yeah, no, it's traditional to start a webinar with a with a technical problem. Um, <laughs> we haven't had one of those yet, but I've just had to move rooms because someone's operating a leaf blower right outside our window. Um, Not so happy to leave my brain. What? What? I'll let you kick it off. Kick it off, Lee. Thank you. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to our Accelerate webinar today. Uh, we'll be talking about the concept of a trusted advisor and trying to unpack that and get under the skin of uh, what it means to be one, uh, and more importantly, how to go about becoming one. Um, a few mechanics before we do that. Um, this is my first time using this setup today, Click Meeting. Um, I feel a bit like a helicopter pilot with a whole multitude of screens to look at in front of me. So hopefully we'll get it right, uh, but do bear with us. Um, I can see can some of you are already have already if, discovered if, the, the chat functionality. I just want to say, um, if anyone's having problems with sound, just just let us know as we as we go through. By the way, sorry, just jump in there. Absolutely. Ho hopefully we're loud and clear. Uh, we're keeping an eye on the chat, so any problems, please flag them up there, and we'll do our best to uh, to fix them. Um, the plan is to talk for about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, we'll then open up and take some questions. Uh, ah, I see. It's, can everyone hear me? I'm uh, Rachel, I think you said it, you, you, you can't hear me when I'm talking. It probably doesn't help if I'm asking you. Okay, looks like it's working for most folk. All right, let, let's, let, let's press on. Um, and uh, we'll make any adjustments in the background that we can. So we have, uh, I think, around 100 people signed up for this today. I see we're about a third of the way uh, to that. Good to see some old friends and indeed some clients in the mix uh, today. Uh, we'll be using a, a hashtag on Twitter for those of you that are using Twitter, which is hashtag IOIC Trusted Advisor. Great to see some of you using that already. Be wrong not to with uh, the hashtag celebrating its 10th birthday uh, yesterday. Um, so just a little uh, quick intro. So my name is Lee Smith. I'm the one on the left here. Uh, well, that's meant to be me, a doctored version of me. Far better looking than the real thing. Um, and my colleague Ian's on the line as well. Uh, we're both from Gatehouse. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Gatehouse. I set the business up a decade ago. Uh, prior to that, worked in-house. Um, and for my sins, I've spent more than a quarter of a century now in this business. Um, Ian, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Yeah, I, I do, and I'm sorry. You know, I said that it's traditional to start with some technical problems. Well, I, I just had one. My my Wi-Fi went off, so I'm sorry about that. Um, you, yeah. So I'm, I'm Ian. I'm one of the associate directors of Gatehouse, um, and I run Accelerate with along with Lee. Um, and it's something we've done for a few years now. And, and this, this whole trusted advisor piece is probably one of the most popular um, parts of that course. So I think that's why we, we, we wanted to give people a little taster of Accelerate. So we, we picked this part because um, it, you know, it's, one of the, it's one of the ones that seems to resonate the most. So looking forward to uh, going through it with you. Thanks, Ian. So yeah, in terms of what we're going to cover off, um, uh, why is being trusted advisor, being a trusted advisor different to being a great internal communicator? This is something that's really at the heart of, of this topic. Um, to be a trusted advisor isn't just about being a great internal communicator and having those fantastic skills, uh, craft skills, planning skills, and so on. It's not just about being top of your game. It actually requires a whole different um, set of skills and behaviors, as we're going to see. Um, what are the beh behavioral characteristics? So we're going to have a look at trusted advisors and, and how they actually behave. Um, and again, try and get some uh, sense of uh, what that means for how we operate on a day-to-day -day, uh, level. Um, we're going to look at how you get close to those who really matter inside your organization. Um, and we're going to look uh, and really focus on, um, I think, a, a killer process, uh, a, a way of approaching any internal communication activity, challenge, project that is designed to build relationships at every opportunity. Um, and relationships are absolutely part and parcel of um, the, the, the remit of a trusted advisor. 
So that's what we're going to cover off over the next 30 or, or so minutes. Uh, before we start to get address the question, what does it mean to be one? I mean, this topic, as Ian said, is something we talk about um, a huge amount through the Accelerate program. It's a topic that's been discussed, um, well, for as long as I can remember in internal comms. Um, when I searched yesterday, we found 10.1 10 million references to Trusted Advisor on Google. Um, and initially, we had over 150 people sign up uh, for this uh, webinar. So real high level of interest. Um, if you look at all of the competency frameworks that have been published in recent years, including the IOIC uh, professions map, which has been published recently, you'll see that um, being a trusted advisor, it features uh, center stage on, on all of those. They may call it different things. They may call it coaching, consulting, facilitating, and so on. Uh, but really, it's about um, what exactly what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. And I think, you know, on a basic level, no matter how much progress we make as a profession, and we've come a long, long way over the last decade in particular, um, practitioners still complain about not having enough influence. And we see that in our state of the sector study feeding through into all sorts of areas like um, budget and uh, position and uh, access to the C-suite and all of these things. So it's important. It's a, it's a real uh, key challenge. Um, for for us as practitioners. So um, what does it mean to be a trusted advisor, Ian? What does it what does it mean? <laughs> and um, you know the definition like one definition I like is um is actually very similar to how the United States Supreme Court once tried to define obscenity back in the 60s. Um, Justice Stewart wrote, I know it when I see it. <laughs> and I kind of think <laughs> it's sometimes the same with um being a trust advisor you can you can just tell you know some, sometimes people have they seem to have this this glow about them um you know we, we when you work in an agency um like like we do at gatehouse we, we sort of encounter people who have all different types of access and influence within their organizations um and what's really interesting is that that influence that they enjoy it just seems to have very little correlation with the job title they've been given or or where internal comms sits as a function. Um, and, and, and these are people who, you know, have, um, they've almost become confidants or like a kind of critical friend or a professional sounding board to, to the people who are in charge of the organization. Um, th there's a quote that I like from the guy who used to be the boss of Harley Davidson, you know, the motorbike firm, John Russell. And he said that at Harley Davidson, um, we sell to 43 year old accountants the ability to dress in leather, ride through small towns and have people be afraid of them. <laughs> you know, in, in the same way, people who are in internal comms, sometimes you have to kind of rise above the machinery of, of communications. And trusted advisors, they sort of deliver more than just the technical mechanics of, um, of comms and, and they deliver something more. And, and, you know, it's often about what they don't do. Than what they do do. Interestingly, we've we've seen heads of internal comms who are on the board of their organisations, um, and we've seen people who would just kind of spend a lot of their time spell checking newsletters. You know, so and, and the and the the difference is this trusted advisor status. You know, so that that sort of brings us onto this slide. Um, some of you might have seen this. This is um Bill Quirk's um roles ladder, and we, we we dig into this quite deeply on the on accelerate um but i'll just kind of go through it quite quickly now he talks about there being five roles okay so from distributor uh, or the kind of organizational post office at the bottom where you're just um maintaining channels and uh operating that basic post office service um running the plumbing of the of the organization um and, and every every organization needs that of course but that's 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 where we came from and it's perhaps not the most uh, valuable um way to influence then then he says the next um step up is this um crafts person this is this is the crafter and drafter this is when those moments when you're um crafting messages and writing and um just putting your uh skills to use on accelerate it's interesting we we ask people like how did you get into internal comms how how did you find this profession um and a lot of people say they came from the media, came from a media background. Um, and 
that that's why I think a lot of us are quite comfortable at this this stage. This is kind of a, a, a step where we're quite happy to be in. Um, and and this is not, although this is towards the bottom of the roles ladder, it's not like a bad spot to be in. I think I remember that I don't want to be like thought for the day or anything, but three three thousand years ago. Solomon said, you know, if you see someone who's skilled in their work, they'll stand before kings. And I think I think that's kind of true here. Um that this is an area we're really good at. Th then moving up, you've got the technical advisor. This is about someone who's kind of uh, knowledgeable on which channels to use and uh they're just knowledgeable about the whole um what internal comms can bring to an organization. And then at the top, you have um consulting and coaching and we could have actually called coaching trusted advisor because that's kind of what we're what we're getting at there when you're acting as a consultant you're um you know you're able to work with business leaders to um identify the communication elements within what they're trying to do um and proposing different solutions to their problem um and then at the top you've got the coach which is about having a just a close enough um relationship with leaders to understand what the issues are and to help them um predict problems with their approach before they've even seen it. Uh, I th and I think the, the point of this um, roles ladder really is that as leaders' expectations of us as a profession increase, we're sort of expected to, well, we are expected to operate much more up here than perhaps down here. But that doesn't mean to say that all the stuff at the bottom isn't valuable. That's almost like the, the table stakes. That's almost like the minimum requirements for um, succeeding in our profession but it's about looking for ways for opportunities to maybe burst or step up to these top two uh, tiers of the roles ladder and, and, and we go into that a little bit more in in, in the full accelerate um, but yeah have you got any any thoughts on this any thoughts on this Lee? Yeah I mean I, I think you're absolutely right Ian. and you know it's another important thing is the ability to move up and down that ladder you know what this isn't is a progression from tactical to strategic and all of a sudden you've got a bird's eye view and all you do is advise on strategy. I think what most of us now find is we have to roll up our sleeves and get stuck in to those craft skills. We have to keep an eye on distribution uh, as well as uh, providing good advice and, and coaching and supporting senior leaders. So it's not a progression, it's a, a, a I guess a, a, a continuum that you move up and down constantly as a professional. But I think you know your point is right. Um, being good at, at internal comms is really merely the license to operate as a trusted advisor. You know, knowing your stuff gets you access to the boardroom, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee you a, a seat at the table. Um, you know, being good at what you do is taken for granted by clients. Um, what we need to do to move into this space of being a coach or a trusted advisor and helping shape the strategy of the organisation, not just communicate it. Uh, is something slightly different, uh, as, as we'll see. Um, the next quote I quite like, so this is from a, a guy whose book I'll recommend shortly, uh, called James uh, Lukashevsky uh, in the US, and he talks about it being, uh, it's about being the number one, number two. So he would say, you know, remember whose bus you're on here. This isn't about um, traipsing on the territory of, of a senior leader. They're, they're the one in charge. But it's about, and the reason any of us exist in support functions, let alone in internal comms, is to support and enable the strategy of the organisation. So remember why we're there and do everything we can to support, enable, coach, counsel um, those who are in charge, become the number one, number two. I like that. So um, what, what makes a trusted advisor let then? Uh, let's get under the skin of that a little bit. Um, Prior to joining uh, Setting Up Gatehouse back in the day, um, I spent my career mainly in financial and professional services. And those of you that operate in, in those areas will in inevitably have come across this book during your time. Um, literally, the, the textbook on becoming a trusted advisor, published, gosh, a couple of decades ago now, is required reading for anyone who's, who aspires to be a partner uh, or, or, or senior within an accountancy or, or a law firm but incredibly relevant to what we do as internal communicators. After all, we're, we're, all we're doing is delivering a, a professional services to, to our clients, be they internal uh, or external. So David Meister is the guy to uh, Google. Um, if you Google him and trust your advisor, you'll come up with all sorts of great stuff, but a really 
uh, recommended read and something we're going to uh, dig into during the, the, the webinar. Uh, so if we look at the traits of a trusted advisor, we, we've, we've interpreted this from some of Maester's work, and we've basically bucketed the characteristics of a trusted advisor into, into these five areas, attitude, personal style, outlook, character, uh, and intellect. And if you just have a quick quick read through those, you know, it's uh, it's quite an ask. It doesn't, doesn't panic or get over emotional. It doesn't try to force things on us, provides options. That one's hugely important. What this isn't, and it, you know, there's a big difference between being a an expert, an internal communication expert who dispenses medicine and, and provides solutions, and being a trusted advisor. What a trusted advisor does is provides options and they allow the client to make the, the ultimate decision on which of those options to choose. So it's a very different mindset. Um, character is honorable and has decent value, values. None of us would, uh, would, would uh, detract from that. Helps us think and separate our logic from our emotions. Remembers everything we said, is in it for the long haul. Um, Long-termism is a really important part of this. And under style there, acts like a person, not a role. Um, again, massively important, you know, this, to, be, to get into this territory and become, uh, build a reputation as a trusted advisor. Um, you need to get beyond being seen as, as a functional person, as just an internal communicator. Um, you need to be someone who has views, opinions, um, uh, uh, and ideas on all sorts of things outside of your uh, classic remit as a communicator. So it's a big ask, you know, when you look at that, it, it, it's almost like a, a role description for a Wonder Woman or, or Superman. So, you know, hard work to get to this stage um, takes a lot of nurturing and a lot of time to build that reputation, but well worth it if you can. So how do you become one? I think, you know, the first question to ask yourselves is, do you want to? You know, there is, let's be honest, there is a a question there there's a decision um, do you want a relationship or do you want a transaction um, there's a there's a choice to be made and sometimes being an expert delivering uh, a solution dispensing the medicine isn't a bad thing let's let's uh, make no bones about that but it may not, not be right in every circumstance and that's part of the judgment call here is who wants uh, a, a simple solution uh, a transaction and who wants and needs a longer term uh, relationship. So another uh, recommended read, uh, my second one for, for today, um, I mentioned him, him earlier, uh, Luka Shevsky. Um, in the States, uh, a crisis communicator, um, great book, um, well worth a read alongside Maester's uh, book. Um, and he talks about the uh, five imperatives, and, and, and these, these are quite interesting, I think, and help set the scene for um, how we set about becoming one. So he talks about jettisoning staff-based assumptions. And the point here is um, get beyond your, your function. If, you, if, you, if all you ever do is think as an internal communicator, all you're ever going to see is communication issues rather than business issues. You know, not everything is a communication problem. And trusted advisors get beyond their function. If you look at the people that chief execs and other uh, senior execs go to um, for, for advice and counsel, they're not thinking in a functional way. They're thinking in a much broader way. So that's hugely important. We've got to get beyond the confines of our role. Um, number two, see the whole board. That's not the, the, the top team. That's the, the chess board, as it were. Adopt a bird's eye view. You know, there is a, there's an altitude uh, piece to this, uh, really important. And I think, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time talking about this, Ian, on, on Accelerate. Um, as communicators, we have a, we're in a unique position. We've got an amazing ability to um, go pretty well anywhere, access all areas within our organisations. Uh, I think because we're tuned in, we're listening to, to employee voice, um, we have, a, have that bird's eye view of things. This is something we can bring to the table far better than most of our functional uh, colleagues in, in, in other areas. So I think it comes natural to us having this bird's eye view, but really, really need to, to nurture that. 
um, tolerate ambiguity but strive for certainty. Again, this is what I made earlier. We need to provide options um, that the client then chooses from, not deliver uh, necessarily a single solution. Maximize, maximize your prerogatives. Uh, again, you know, you're in a unique position as communicators. We're incredibly well placed to move into this territory of trusted advisor. Very few uh, colleagues in other functions have quite the access uh, that, that we do. So take full advantage of it. And number five there, develop real expertise be, be beyond your function. We've got, we know this, we've talked about this for a long, long time as a profession. We need to know the business. We need to know the operations. We need to get our heads around the, the metrics. We need to understand what's keeping our senior leaders awake at night. And we need to have views on those, you know, get beyond just thinking about things from a pure internal, uh, internal comms perspective. Okay, Ian, I think you're going to talk us through uh, a, a process, a way of thinking about uh, projects, activities, um, initiatives that, that help build relationships, which is really at the heart of uh, this call to be a trusted advisor. Yeah, thanks, Lee. I, I, I will do. Um, we, we we use this on Accelerate, and it's called the, the consultancy cycle. Um, and you, you can see it here. Um, it's a it's basically a simple consulting model and and there's a lots of these out there and you know some of them might use different labels but th they're all kind of fairly similar um but this basically shows you the process that you should follow in a typical client project and it, and it's also i mean we're using it um to describe how you should kind of operate within an organization as as an internal communicator whether you're solo or as a function just to kind of um build effective relationships. Um, so someone who came on Accelerate was saying that they, um, they'd they had a bit of a disaster with <laughs> their chief executive. Um, a project hadn't gone very well at all and she'd really annoyed him. Um, and the relationship was basically in the toilet. And she sort of had this eureka moment, but looking at this uh, consultancy cycle, because she realized um, immediately where she'd gone wrong. And it, it's some it's something I, I do. I do this all the time. Um, many of us get wrong. We, we skip straight to to doing stuff, right? So someone asks us for something and we just take action um, because we're kind of capable people and we just like, you know, getting things done. But look at look at where that is on this consultancy cycle, like implementing or taking action is like number six. <laughs> it's like the sixth step. Um, and she she went back and I'll, I'll walk you through it now and then we can talk about it after but she went back and um followed the consultancy cycle and um and she said it was just like night and day she she did this project went really well she got on the side of the uh chief executive and had a really good uh you know built a really good relationship with him and um i think she actually keeps this um blue tacked up on her desk um but she uh, she says she hides it or takes it down when he comes around so she, she he doesn't know that she's got like a little model for interacting with him um but yeah let, let, let's walk through this consultancy cycle so um phase one is, is is gaining entry so what does that mean i mean we we could have called that setting out your stall so that's um making sure that you're visible within the organization uh and, and people know what they can come to you for and what they can't come to you for we like at gatehouse we do one of the main well one of the big things we do is internal comms audits um and one part of that is we ask leaders in the organization just what they know about internal comms and what they think of internal comms and every time we do this it's just all over the map i mean people leave across the business just have no idea what comms is there to do they sometimes they don't know how big the team is they might think it's 50 people they might just think it's nobody um it really varies so people are not very clear on what internal comms is there to do sometimes so there's a whole piece here around setting out your store correctly you know, do, do people know what you're there to do and what you're not there to do? Have you kind of done that in a charter? Um, you know, like they say an, ants are attracted to picnics and you you want the right people to show up and eat what you're laying out on the blanket. You know, I, I'm not sure how far I can take that metaphor, but um, <laughs> you, <laughs> that's important because you, you, you want the right kind of customers, you know, and a big part of that is 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 uh, is setting out your store correctly. Uh, if you you know if you don't go looking for trouble, then it, it's going to come and find you. 
So that, that that's and a lot of the functions that we know are, are actually going through that process at the moment. It might not be as official as defining a charter, but it's just like defining what they're there to do. Um, so that's important. The next phase is this con contracting phase. So you've got one of your little, I'm going to draw a little ant. You've got your customer. Um, now, the next important piece to do is um, setting clear boundaries and agreeing what is covered and what is not covered by your consulting relationship, if you want to call it that. that that's really important for us as internal consultants or internal comms because the role your role can be quite blurred you know due to um competing priorities and th this this idea that um comms is just a catch-all for everything um it, if you if you get this phase right then it's much easier to say no when you're asked to do work later on that's outside the initial scope um because the thing about comms is that people they often think you're just going to wave a magic wand and do things i mean how many times have people asked said to you can you just sprinkle some comms fairy dust on this? <laughs> um, so contracting is a really important phase. What what you, what you're there to do and what you're not there to do in in the context of a, a job. Um, let me try and delete my scribbles. The, the next the next phase. So you, you've got your customer. You've agreed what the you know what success looks like. Um, then the next phase is about collecting data. Um, so this is about identifying and having access to the right information that you need to to find out what their problem is and deliver a solution. Um, and that's not always easy, right? Because some information that you need is going to be closely guarded and it might prove difficult to access unless you've got a good relationship with that person. And the other side to this is that the minute you start asking for data or asking for other um, information, people get a bit surprised because um, they don't really understand that there's a lot more to what we do than just producing newsletters, and just churning out collateral. They might they might not have thought of this as something that you would need access to, like certain metrics or audience data for. So that so that's an interesting phase. Um, and I think so you again, know, it, Ian, it, like uh, other functions, when you look around at the functions that do have that seat at the table, often they're you know they're much more insight and metrics driven. You know, again, we know this for a decade. We've been been surveying companies all around the world through through the state of the sector study and still today we're very very poor at, at, at metrics and measurement and evaluation so you know we have to get much more insight based uh, as professionals um really vital part of the of the of the process yeah totally and they, they might say you know why, why, why do the fluffy folk need these numbers um what, what, what's rachel saying it's a comms job yeah that's really funny um so, so the next the next phase is, is is diagnosing, and this sounds like quite medical, doesn't it? Um, and that's because a lot of consulting relationships do echo that that doctor patient relationship with with the person with one party, you know, your client looking for an expert diagnosis from the other. Um, and this is where you get to the root. This is really where you get to the root of the problem. So they might come to you asking for a newsletter, but is a newsletter really what they need? What are they trying to achieve here? All that kind of stuff. You can really dig into the um, dig into the problem here. Um, then the next it's phase, about, it's, uh, it's about root root cause analysis, really, Ian, and just get you know what is it, what is really driving this, what is the issue, and you know, asking questions is a is a skill that is again at the heart of being a good advisor. You know, five whys. Why why is that? Why is that the issue? What's the real issue? Let's get to the bottom of it. That's the diagnosing process we need to go through. Yeah, exactly. And, and this and phase five, you know, coming up with options kind of, it, to be honest, it sort of blends into phase four sometimes. Um, but again, this is a this is a step that a lot of people need to take, you know, ask for um, a beagle. Why are you offering me border collies? Right. But the people don't expect people might think the solution is black and white. But in fact, you obviously you're much closer to the, the audience than they are. So you're in a much better position to figure out what it is that they really need. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people, they think they want you to behave like a pharmacist. You know, you go into the pharmacy and <clears throat> you ask for a, a drug and they just give you the drug. Whereas actually it, it's much more valuable to you to act as a doctor and, and kind of um, diagnose and generate options for them. Um, so that's a really important phase. Um, and then, of course, this, this is where you actually do it. <laughs> this is where you kind of deliver and take action. So there are five steps to go through before you get to phase six. Um, 
and you know the, the, i won't go into this because this is obviously where we're comfortable with and um it involves turning stuff into reality um and then the final point is, is disengaging um what one of the things that is, is really important we don't do enough of i think in our profession is closing down projects properly um and there's there's two aspects to that if you don't kind of formally declare a project over it's difficult to move on to the next one with them um and that's really important if we're talking about building relationships and creating this virtuous cycle of every time you work on a project for them um you get better and better at it and you kind of get closer to what they actually really need um so and, and the other side to that of course is that if you don't close down projects and disengage properly you end up with lots of uh sort of zombie projects, these kind of live projects that appear dead, but could just reanimate and bite you in the neck at any minute. Um, so the consultancy cycle, what we we'll sometimes ask is that um, this just seems really like a long, there's like seven steps, this just seems like a long process. And but the thing, the thing to point out is that it doesn't have to take, you know, a day or a week to go through this. You could go through it in the course of one conversation. Um, so it, it it's very very scalable so you don't have to kind of a doesn't have to be a burdensome process and of course you once you've gone through this process once with someone the next time you work with them you're more familiar with it familiar with the fact that you need to collect data you're going to diagnose options and you're not just going to um say how high when they say jump so that is the consultancy cycle obviously you're going to get these um slide or i think you're going to get the slides um yeah, we're going to send you the slides and, and you can watch the replay as well. Um, pe people sometimes tweak this a little bit and that's fine, but hopefully that helps um, give you a sort of operating model for um, interacting with people and building these trusted relationships within within your organisation. Um, I think, Ian, is, you know, there's an interesting thing between, I know we've got some some folk on the, on the webinar that are from agencies and a, an awful lot that are from in-house. You know, if you think about this as someone who's come being an in-house communicator to set up an agency, you know, as an agency, you very visibly have to go through all these phases. You know, we 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 set a very clear value proposition, which you know is our is our core decks and our our website. You know, it's very clear what we're about as an agency, what we what we do and don't do. That's the phase one. You know, we then we then whenever we work with a new client, we really. Uh, interrogate and make sure we've got that crystal clear brief that's contracting that's the phase two piece put put the legal piece to one side we do the audits very often to, to then get the, the data and the insight we need uh, we then do the interpretation and the strategy building uh, and, and, and on to the creative execution and so on so as an agency you're kind of forced to do this you know when you set up an agency you haven't got a reputation to build it from scratch you know those every relationship with a new client is a new relationship so you have to fast track through this um process but you know i think you're absolutely right it's a it's a, it's a cycle that could be applied to you know big change programs uh huge projects or or indeed you know a, a simple town hall event or a, or a panel delivery yeah, of a particular channel I mean, there are some people we all know that that they see internal comms as just like a sweet shop where they can where everything's free. They can just go in and grab whatever they want and kind of run out again. Mm -hmm. And it and it's it's not like that. There's a there's a process to follow. Um, and it isn't a kind of bureaucratic process, but there has to be some friction between, you know, them getting what they want and and you and you doing it for them. Um, so I think that this this is this is one model that yeah that we that we that we like. Um. Any other questions? Gillian uh, is is asking about the arrow going into sort of eagle-eyed uh, spotted this arrow going in here. Um, yeah, that's that's because it's um, sometimes you you deliver for them, you know, you do what they want, and then maybe uh, it doesn't work or they don't get what they need. Um, so you have to kind of go back to this phase scope, of contract. Yeah, and then... all the scope changes in. You know, that's very often for an agency. Yeah. You know, we set out, we deliver the initial initial deliverable, and then the scope changes we have to do something else so you go back through that that cycle again um so you never actively active actually disengage um you, you keep it on and, and i think that's probably familiar i know from my days in house you know you get pulled pulled from one project to the next and that's half the challenge well 
Okay, um, how are we doing for, for time? I think we're, we're, we're fast running out of time. Um, I'm very open to taking questions now. Uh, Sarah at IOIC, do we, do we open up the lines or do we uh, ask for questions here on, on the chat? Um, if there are any questions, feel free to tap them into the chat. I think you guys are, um, are muted at this stage. Uh, but happy to answer any questions or hear reflections and, and thoughts on what we said. Um, obviously, today's a, a bit of a, a whistle stop tour of a very deep subject that we're going to much more on, on the Accelerate programme. Yeah, I'm happy to take questions in the chat box if people want to type some questions in there. We've also had some questions coming in um, through email. So there was an interesting question about um, the difference between an extrovert and an introvert. So do you have to be an extrovert to be a trusted advisor was the question. Uh, yeah, that's, I'll take that as a self-confessed introvert. I'll take, I'll take that one, Sarah. So I, I would say absolutely not. You know, what you do need is, is a voice. So, you know, that's, perhaps more difficult for us introverts in some settings. Um, but, you know, it's about relationships and whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you can build build relationships in, in, in different ways. So you play to your own strengths and your own style. Um, and, uh, you know, I think regardless of, of your, your personality, uh, you can become a trusted advisor. But, but I will emphasize you do need to have opinions and uh, a, a voice. Do you have any thoughts, Ian, on, on that one? I don't. I, I will say yes. for it's um for being introverts, introverts do go on about being introverts quite a lot, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, I, I'm an introvert. They're probably sitting quietly in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm an introvert. Yeah, and and any other um. Uh, I just saw uh, Gillian's just asked, uh, uh, no, actually, sorry, Terry's asked, um, would measurement be in phase six? Yeah, really good call. I mean, it, absolutely, it's in phase three in terms of an audit and understanding the current state. But you're right, as you're implementing, you're taking action, you're, you're, you're delivering um, the, the communications program activity, whatever it is, you, you want to be um, evaluating all the way through, I would say. So yeah, I think you know certainly um, research and evaluation for us is something that should thread through all of this, um, not be something that's done just at the end or, or indeed the beginning. So I can see a few people are typing some questions now. So if we <clears throat> just wait a second. Well, it's interesting the reaction to, to the term trusted advisor because sometimes um sometimes it can be a bit cringe you know when people like you see people on on linkedin they it's a bit like the term thought leader you know people, you get some people know who they put they put trusted advisor in their linkedin profile and I, i'm never quite sure i'm never quite sure about that like i'm never <laughs> sure if if it's something you, that if it's a bunch you can make for yourself yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, we we also it's fair to say we see it coming through in a lot of the job ads now, and and often the roles that have trusted advisor in the description tend to pay a little bit more. So that's a, a good a good reason as any to uh, to pay attention to it. I'm just looking on Twitter, Nick Andrews. Thanks for your uh, photo of Pauline Quirk. Just to quite clarify, it's Bill Quirk, the uh, internal communicator, rather than uh, Pauline. But <laughs> that made me <laughs> Rachel, is that little look? That's a very salient point, sage point from, from Rachel there. Um, the chat yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah, totally agree, Rachel, there. Um, you know, I think one of the best ways to become a trusted advisor is stop talking about comms when advising their business. You need to sort of speak the language of leaders. Um, absolutely. You know, as we said earlier, belief that you can do your job, that you know your stuff, that you, you've got your, your professional um, uh, spurs and so on, is it, 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 taken as read. That's the license to operate at this level. You need to get beyond the confines of um, your, your job role, your, your function, 
and start thinking as a commercial business person. That's how you really move up into this uh, this zone. Elizabeth, what would be the key actions to change uh, perceptions within an organisation of, of the IC role from technical to trusted advisor? So I think, you know, as we said, it's it's a bit of a Wonder Woman, Superman type of uh, expectation uh, to, to do this well. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. I think the first thing to flag is it, it's, it takes time to build a reputation. It takes time. To build trust, you can you can obviously kill it um, in, in in no time, but to, to create it in the first place does take time. So, and I think you know for us, it's about not what necessarily what you do, but how you go about it, how you talk to people, how you connect with people. Um, it's about asking the right questions. It's about genuinely listening. One of the little tactics that we um, talk about in Accelerate is having. Um, having up your sleeve or in your pocket a list of, of 20 questions. If you're stuck in the lift with the CEO, it's tw 20 questions that you could ask them. And every opportunity you get, you ask one or two of those and you refresh it with one or two more questions. So again, little things like that, being seen as someone who's inquisitive and we're, we're great for that in internal comms. That's often why we gravitate towards this profession. Uh, having questions up your sleeve um, being able to ask challenging, interesting, insightful questions, being being able to listen and not just uh, bang on about comm stuff. Um, I think those are the things that start to build that reputation. Um, but it but 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 it will be done over time. Okay, any other any other questions? I was just I was just thinking about that last question actually, because um, we, we we've known people who've actually left organisations because this, despite you know moving heaven and earth and applying all this stuff, they've just they've just not got the leader to take it seriously, and so some some people have actually struggled to move out of that um, you know post office role. Uh, so I think in a very small number of cases, it might the organisation might not be ready for it. Um, I don't know what you what you think, Lee. I mean, I think yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, at the end of the day, there are there are, are skeptics out there. Um, there are there are people who get internal comms, employee engagement, and everything that, that brings to a, to an organisation. And there are some, sadly, still out there that that, that don't get that. And you know, you you're probably not going to convert them. But what there will be in the organisation are folks who do get it and. You know, part of this is about being clear who who you want to build that relationship with. And, you know, that might mean going in a less direct way. Uh, it might not be about the CEO at all. You know, there's communicators operating at all levels. So, you know, often it's about becoming a trusted advisor to your your own um, line manager and, and working through them. So I think there's lots of different ways, but you're right in, you know, not every organisation is 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 ready and prepared to 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 listen to us oh we yeah. missed a question what have we missed i think it's does it look like we've missed something here i think sarah yeah. it, sarah is asking asked the question it, it it's like it, it sort of scrolled off my <laughs> my chat box it's like it's like my twitter feed has just gone um so it was a good question though cat so comms can be something that many people think they can do um and so that um how can you show the value of having an, ex an expert and the value that you add? And I, I can think of a, a big professional services organization we, we know who's, who's having this problem as well. And it, it, everyone on this webinar, I bet, will have people who just think that comms is something they can do just because they can speak English. Um, and there's loads of different responses to that. What one response that one client of ours is doing is they're actually, they're actually kind of um, they're actually just introducing a more of a self-serve model. So they've realized that they can't do everything for everybody. So they're actually just creating templates and guides to kind of bounce as much as possible back to people so they can actually uh, kind of take on a lot of the work themselves. And so they, it's freeing them up to focus on the more strategic um, more strategic stuff. That's a, yeah, that's a great example, Ian, actually. And, you know, um, being able to say no to some of the 
less value adding activities is is important and you know it's part of that um, value proposition when you set out your store you know a lot of communicators now working on toolkits and, and so on to equip um clients to be able to do a certain amount for themselves templated ways of doing things um that's a, a really good example and, and a lot a lot of the way that you can show the value of having an expert is I mean, this this is a this is actually a great time to be in this profession because there's so much change happening um, in in organisations. Um, I, I don't want to kind of talk in cliches here, but like organisations like are transforming their operating models. That they're, they're worried about being disrupted from other industries, and they're all they're kind of having to um, you know change changes the new norm. You know, and that's I know that's a terrible cliche, but it certainly feels like that. And within organizations that there's just such a story of confusion. I mean, people, one, we do comms audits and people just don't know the left arm doesn't know what the right arm is doing. And the, some of the people who we've seen achieve this like trusted advisor status and they're really seen as experts in the business it, is they've been able to like join the dots between different projects and programs and show what, show what the organization is actually um, trying to achieve um, because organizations directions and strategies and where they're heading can, can be quite um it can be quite a complex one to tell and a lot of people even in transformation programs that are like three or four years in a lot of people just don't understand what's happening and why um and what we're really good at what we're really good at is painting a picture of the future and explaining what all that means and, and what's actually happening so that that's a that's a really big opportunity for us to to show how um, much value we add because the, the amount of money organizations spend on these and how important they are is just uh is just mind-boggling um just looking through the thread again uh leslie yeah absolutely you know building our skills as communicators massively important um you know, you, you, as we saw with that roles ladder, and uh, we talked about the time you need to be able to move up and down that. You know, this is about elevating yourself to some strategic role and, and then letting go of every everything tactical. Um, the reality is we need to be able to move up and down. And actually, you know, it's often the tactical things, like this speech or preparing a PowerPoint, dare I say, that will give us um, access to those stakeholders in the first place enable us to quickly build our reputation and, and and show our value add so i think you know that's really important for me is you know it's not about suddenly you're at the top of the on the top table looking down on everything else i think to be great a great internal communicator you've got to be able to move up and down and do the do as well as advise counsel and guide strategy i would say as well like um the, the um there's that old quote <laughs> show me show me your friends and i'll show you your future you know they they say that you're then they say that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with um i'm not sure i'm not sure how how much i want that to be true but um it, it's definitely true that the people you mix with are, are kind of set the set influence who you are and i think that's one of the good things about like the ioic and some of the um, networking things that they have and just just other ones that happen on LinkedIn it's really good to um, spend time with other communicators who are kind of maybe have got a bit more of this cracked because they, they influence you like like when people come on at accelerate what one of the things that they always say is them um, uh, it's really good be, just being in the room with like 12 other people who have the same challenges as them um, so yeah I think any opportunity that you can get to, to mix with other communicators because it can be a lonely profession. Um, any opportunity you get, you, you should take. And I think that that's a really big piece of this. It's a good point, Ian, actually. I think about with our own clients, often you know, one of the big things that they value from us as an agency is, is our insight into what works elsewhere. You know, we're, we're lucky enough to go into loads of large organizations all around the world constantly through the audit work we do. Um, but, but actually, you know, to your point, getting out there, talking, connecting, networking, understanding good practice out there and bringing that back um is again a really powerful way that shows you're not too insular and too inward looking which is again really important cool should we i sort of don't want to keep people but equally i don't want to 
kick them off if they've if you've still got questions. <laughs> so. I think so. Sarah's just asked, do we get many people on the course from higher higher stroke education sector? Um, we've run Accelerate now for about five five years. Um, we've had people from pretty well every walk of life. I think a few from the world of, of academia. Um, I think the principles in Accelerate like this one are applicable whatever sector um, you're operating in. But Sarah, happy to talk offline if um, if you want. We're happy to have a conversation with you on on that piece. Um, on Accelerate, uh, I think all of you as participants in this webinar are going to get an email afterwards with um, the, the links and so on. Um, we're also going to offer a 10% discount, a little special offer as our thank you for, for rocking up for this webinar. Um, so if you make a booking for Accelerate before the end of September, you'll get a 10% discount on the standard costs. Woohoo, indeed. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, that, the next cycle is running in September, but we run Accelerate quarterly uh, and also as an in house program if you're interested in that. So, uh, look out for that, and hopefully, we'll see some of you on the, on the program in the coming months. Uh, I hope it's been useful. It, you know, there's a lot of depth to this topic. Um, a couple of books there to, to, to dean to for those of you like me that are uh, reflector learners. Um, David Meister, highly recommended, um, uh, and uh, the, uh, the the other book we talk, talked about from Lukashevsky, uh, well worth a look as well. Um, uh, lots of resources out there. Um, and uh, if we can be of any assistance, do please give us either myself or Ian a shout. Uh, great talking to you all. Um, I hope the tech has worked okay, and um, all of you managed to stay stay on for the, the duration of the webinar. Thanks, everyone. And um, Sarah, unless there's anything else from the IOIC side, shall we wrap up there? Sure, yeah. Just to say thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and thank you for all your questions and your comments. It was really great. And um, look out for an email from me um, with the discount that we mentioned. Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. And we'll, we'll no doubt continue the dialogue on Twitter. So uh, I'll see you on there in a few minutes. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, folks. Thanks. Bye.